Hello, and welcome to the third episode in the series, Tales of TR, presented by the Theodore Roosevelt Institute at Long Island University. Our speaker is Tweed Roosevelt, the great grandson of Theodore Roosevelt. Today's episode is titled, Down the Amazon. You can watch previous episodes of our lecture series by visiting our website, at liu.edu slash Roosevelt. During the presentation, we invite you to ask questions in the chat box and Professor Roosevelt will answer as many as possible toward the end of our program. It is now my distinct honor to welcome Professor Tweed Roosevelt to begin today's presentation. Welcome everybody. Welcome back for those of you coming back and welcome new people. I hope you're all doing fine in these rather difficult times. Uh, uh, this is, of course, the third of uh, my series of Tales of TR. Uh, and I am Tweed Roosevelt, a professor at LIU and chairman of the, Long I of the Theodore Roosevelt Institute at Long Island University, uh, which is bringing you this program. So today's session is entitled, Down the Amazon. It's really kind of unlike our previous sessions and our future ones, in that it's less about history and more about adventure. It is the story of two journeys, both on the same river, but one 80 years apart from the other one. The river was first called the Rio Duvida, which means the River of Doubt, later renamed the Rio Roosevelt. It's one of the thousand or more major tributaries of the Amazon River, and it's 850 miles long and larger than the Hudson. Uh, the Brazilian team, which went down in 1914, included TR, TR and the Brazilian team, and they were the first outsiders to ever go down the river. Uh, my group retraced that event in 1992. And so I'm going to tell you about both trips, and I'm going to have images from both trips, which I think you'll find very interesting. So let me start at the beginning of my involvement uh, with this whole adventure. I knew about TR's trip down the Amazon vaguely. Uh, I had read about it. I knew it was a difficult trip, although I had no idea how difficult it was going to be. Uh, and uh, I thought, you know, I'd thought over the years, well, maybe I'll go down the river sometime, maybe I'll try it. But it was one of those things, you know, you have a sort of a fantasy about. I never really did anything about it. Well, over the years, I got two or three calls from people who said they were interested in retracing this trip. Uh, and so I talked to them and I said, I'd be fine. Uh, you know, could help them in any way I could. And they all fizzled out. So that, uh, you know, nothing really ever came of it, and I never did anything particularly well. In 1990, I got a call from someone who seemed a little more likely to do it. First of all, he had the money to do it, uh, and he said he was organizing this retracing event, and would I be interested? So it occurred to me that, well, okay, you know, uh, he sounds legitimate, but uh, who knows what happens. He was talking about a trip two years in the future. And that seemed a long way. And I, the experience of the other one fizzled. I said, why not? I could join the, join, say I'm going to join the expedition. Say it would be a wonderful time. Uh, you know, I could get all the credit for it. If it fizzled out in the end, then I wouldn't actually have to do anything. Uh, well, uh, he said, fine. He said, my first assignment was to uh, uh, study TR's trip. So I started looking into TR's trip. Well, first I read his book. He wrote a book about it called Through the Brazilian Wilderness, about 500 pages. Very interesting book. So I learned about there. And also three or four other people who were involved in this expedition one way or another wrote books on the subject. So I read those books. And then they've been published by historians, a number of books, the most recent major one uh, by uh, Millard, Kathy Millard, called uh, the, the River of Doubt. Excellent book, if you want to read about this after we finish here. She published a book. Well, then I went over to Harvard University to the Houghton Library, where TR's, collections, uh, TR's collection is, and went through his diaries and read newspaper accounts and so on. And the more I read, the more horrified I became. It was really a very, very grueling trip. 
I began to wonder what have I gotten myself into, but I still have the, the two years hope and the fizzling out hope. Uh, so let me start off by telling you about TR's trip. Uh, and it all started in 1912 when TR lost his run for the presidency, his third term president running for the presidency as a bull moose candidate. And when TR had sort of major negative things happen in his life, he typically went off on some kind of an expedition. So when his uh, wife and mother died on the same day, uh, devastating experience that some of you heard about in a previous lecture, uh, his idea was to go out to North Dakota. When he finished, when he left the White House, a big letdown, as you might imagine, he went to Africa for a full year safari. And so after the uh, uh, 1912, he decided he'd do something down in Brazil. Uh, he'd go to Brazil. He'd been invited by a number of different countries to come and give speeches. He was very popular in South America at the time, in spite of what some historians have said. In any case, uh, and then he thought he might do something on the river, Amazon, the river Amazon. So he remembered he'd met a character named Father Zahm, a Catholic priest. Uh, he'd met him when he was in the White House and Zahm was lobbying TR to go to the Amazon instead of Africa. Well, he didn't go to the Amazon, he went to Africa, but he remembered this. So he called up Father Zahm and they start talking. And they made a plan, and their plan was a very ambitious one, that after he finished uh, his speeches, he would go up to Paraguay from Argentina, up into uh, uh, the highlands above the Amazon, the southern highlands above the Amazon. And then he would go over to the Amazon, one of the tributaries called the Tapajos, and go down the Tapajos until he got to the Amazon. And then the Amazon, he'd go up the Amazon a bit, and then go up the Rio Negro, all the way up to the highlands in the north, and then he'd go over into Venezuela and down the Orinoco and eventually wind up in the Caribbean. Now, this was an extremely ambitious uh, uh, proposal that he had. Uh, it was not on undiscovered rivers. These rivers were all well-traveled, uh, but it was just so long and ambitious. In fact, uh, it had never been done before. TR did it, and I don't think it's ever been done in a single trip, even to today. So that was kind of the plan. Now, TR typically very carefully planned out his trips, but this time uh, was different. He was distracted by various things. He left the planning up to Zom, and Zom wasn't a particularly good planner. Uh, so there were some issues. Well, TR uh, started down. He was going to begin, and begin his tour in Brazil, a speaking tour. When he arrived in Brazil, he was met by the foreign minister, a fellow named Laurel Miller. And the foreign minister had a proposal, a different kind of trip for TR. And this is, was his proposal. He said, you know, uh, our entire population virtually is on the coast. And we have this huge central Amazon area, valley, that uh, we know very little about. And we have been sending uh, exploration trips in there. And they've been led by Colonel Candido Rondon, a military officer. And he's kind of our Lewis and Clark. You had Lewis and Clark to uh, discover the whole Northwest there. Well, we have our Lewis and Clark, except the difference is instead of one long expedition, he makes frequent expeditions in there. And he's just returned and he's just discovered the headwaters, what he thinks might be a major river. They don't know where it goes, but it really shouldn't be there because the map makers had, had uh, designed, uh, had plunked down a bunch of mountains where there weren't any, it turned out there weren't any. And anyway, he's gonna go back and maybe this would turn out to be a major tributary of the Amazon. And Mr. President, or Colonel, as TR liked to be called then, uh, would you like to go with him? Well, this seemed like a, too good to be true for TR. Candy to a baby. He said, of course, I'll go with him. So then TR went off on his uh, speaking tours. And uh, uh, when he finished them, he found himself in Argentina. And he went up the Paraguay River like he had planned to do. Uh, but when he got up into the Brazilian highlands, came to a city called Cuiaba, and that's where he met Colonel Rondon. And from there, that was their jumping off point uh, to, uh, to the headwaters of this river. And so uh, he met Colonel Rondon, and they had to go across a, a, an area, a high sort of plains area in Brazil. It's called the Alto Plano. It's a mystique, a mystique, uh, kind of shrub area, very, very dry, very difficult. Uh, 
and they were going to have to carry a whole bunch of equipment with them to get to the headwaters of the river. Uh, Colonel Rondon usually went with very small expeditions, but this one was going to have more than 20 people in it and needed a lot more in the way of materials. Well, anyway, they had to drag all this stuff. It took them 30 days to go across the, the Alto Plano and uh, really tough. They had ox carts and the ox, oxen started dying. There was a whole story just there to get to the river. And by the time they got to the river, they'd lost a lot of their stuff. And already things were not looking the way they had hoped they would. Well, when they got to the river, uh, they uh, prepared to go down. And let me tell you who the participants in this were. There was, uh, of course, TR. And TR's son, Kermit, had joined him. Kermit had been with him in Africa. And Kermit had been working in Brazil as an engineer building bridges. And he was engaged and was planning to get married shortly. And his wife to be was his fiance was an American, but she happened to be in, uh, in Spain because her father was ambassador. And so he's planning to do that. But his mother talked him into postponing it somewhat because she wanted him to go with TR and, you know, look after him on this trip. And the third American was a fellow named George Cherry, who was a naturalist. Uh, and TR liked to take on these trips a naturalist. He thought they should have do some purpose for science. Uh, and on the Brazilian side, there was Rondon. And then there was a guy named Lieutenant Lyre, who's a, who, a map maker, whose job was to make them. And the whole idea, of course, on these expeditions was to make maps and see what was there. And then they took a doctor because they uh, wanted to make sure that TR came out alive. Um, it, uh, Laurel Mello thought this would all be a good publicity stunt for Brazil, putting it on the world map, but it wouldn't be such a good stunt if TR died. So they, they had a Brazilian doctor. The problem was that he didn't come particularly well prepared. In fact, the only piece of medical equipment uh, he had was a stethoscope. Uh, I don't think TR knew that at the time. And along with the Brazilians, there were 17 paddlers to paddle the big dugouts that they had. So anyway, they started down the river on what turn, would turn out to be really a hellish ordeal. Uh, they didn't know how long they were going to be there. They had no idea where the river went. You know, they, it could sort of curve into another tributary pretty quickly, or it might go a long, long way down to the Amazon. Uh, and they knew that uh, it would be at probably at least 60 or more days but they uh, only took enough food for 30 days. And what they planned to do was to hunt along the way and supplement their provisions. And they planned to harvest Brazil nuts. Now, when I read that, I thought, yeah, that's an unlikely thing. Brazil nuts, I don't, I'm sure most of you know what a Brazil nut, but you probably don't know how it comes. It comes in a coconut-like, hard, uh, almost mahogany-like husk, big thing, you know, maybe uh, six or eight inches across. And it's really hard to get into that. And when you get into it, you don't get the Brazil nuts, you get the Brazil nuts in their shells. And their shells are really hard to crack. And when you finally got and cracked the shells, you wind up with a small Brazil nut. It seemed to me a lot of work. And uh, I don't know, trying to live on Brazil nuts didn't seem to me like a particularly good idea. It is high in protein, fat, but anyway. And well, I heard that you could make a grind them up and make kind of a five, uh, bread dough out of it, but it didn't seem very promising. But anyway, that was their plan. Well, the problem became clear almost immediately. They were going down in the rainy season and the water was high, so there was no game near the river. There was nothing they could hunt. And the Brazil nuts were having an off year, and hardly any around. Uh, so they knew right away they were in trouble, and they knew food was going to be a problem, and they said to start to rationing it. So that was one thing. The second thing is almost immediately they became, they came onto the rapids. This is a very high area with steep, steep down uh, area for hundreds of miles with rapids after rapids after rapids. And they were in big dugout, uh, they called them canoes, real dugouts uh, that couldn't go over rapids. So they had to portage around them. And that was a strenuous and difficult task. So uh, things were slowed up. And of course, the food was beginning to run out. Well, then various things happened. Fairly early, what happened was that Kermit was in one of the canoes with a paddler and his dog. And against orders, he decided to paddle across the top of this rapids. 
and I guess he miscalculated because he got caught in the rapids. The rapids uh, rolled the canoe over and over. He was ejected along with the paddler and the dog. When they got to the bottom, uh, Kermit half drowned, just barely managed to save himself, and so did the dog. But the paddler was drowned, and he was he, his body was never found. What happens is there are overhangs on the edge of the river, the trees and vines and so on, and a body will get swept under there and eaten by whatever is under there. So they never found him. Now, this was a big blow to everybody, as you can imagine, and particularly to T.R., who uh, was determined to get his son back for his wedding. Uh, and so the, the purpose of the expedition changed on both sides. Rondon was interested in mapping it, mapping this whole thing, and that's a slow process. TR now became interested in just getting down to the bottom, so that could have created certain kinds of, of uh, uh, conflicts between the leadership here, and the leadership was divided, so there were all kinds of issues that you, you could talk about. I was learning about all this as I was reading on and on about it. Well, of course, food was getting worse. Uh, and you know, there was real no guarantee that they would get out. And pretty quickly, they realized there was a substantial chance they'd never make it out. Uh, and then uh, there were the Indians, the local Indians, they're now called the Centralaga Indians who were there. And they were, uh, they didn't want to be seen. There were plenty of signs of them, you know, you could see camps and, and tracks and so on. But they dogged the expedition uh, and the expedition knew they were being watched, they could hear them, and the Indians would put encouraging signs to encourage people to move on quickly. So for example, Rondon was walking about one rapids, and uh, he had a, his dog in front of him, the dog yelped and came back and was full of arrows and died at his feet. And another time, as the Indians left on one of the tracks around the rapids, a freshly severed monkey's head with arrows in it. I mean, even the densest of explorers would know what that meant. Now Rondon himself was half Indian, which was really extraordinary. And he was determined to have friendly relationships with the Indians. He did that, he had a rule which he kept his whole life of exploration. Never kill an Indian, die if you must, but never kill an Indian. Well, uh, I don't think I really need to go into much more except to say that TR got very sick. Uh, the first thing, they started getting malaria and dysentery and so on, and so did the other people. But the real problem TR had was uh, he had had a carriage accident when he was president that caused an anaerobic infection in his thigh bone. And even today, it is extremely hard to treat something like that with antibiotics. And of course, they didn't have it. And they could get it under control, but it could be reactivated at any moment. And when he banged his leg, it could get reactivated. And he did on this trip. He banged it and it was tremendous flare up of the infection, which was life, definitely life threatening. So the doctor felt he had to operate. And so T, he operated on tear. Problem was he had no equipment, no anesthetic, no anesthesia. And what he used to operate was a pen knife. And he cut TR open to the bone and scraped the bone with the pen knife. Uh, this, as you can imagine, TR was a tough nut. This was really quite an experience. And his health degenerated quite quickly after that. And he became delirious. It looked like he was going to, uh, uh, they, there were times when they despaired. He'd live through the night. He would quote over and over again. And Xanadu did Kubla Khan and things like that. And uh, several times, uh, it didn't look like he was going to make it. At one point, he uh, begged uh, Kermit, who was concerned about everybody else. They'd slowed him up, everybody else threatening the expedition. He told Kermit to leave him behind, but Kermit refused, as did Rondon. Years later, T.R. said on expeditions like this, he always took enough morphine to kill himself. And uh, he added on this trip, and he said the only reason he didn't use it was he knew that Kermit would take him out dead or alive, and it was a little bit easier to take him alive. So uh, you can imagine, as I'm reading all this, I'm getting more and more concerned. I don't need to, I think, really go into any more about their trip. You can get the picture. I will tell you, that uh, two months, a little more than two months uh, into the expedition, they came out at the bottom and TR was 55 pounds lighter. Whoosh. Uh, well, that last bit seemed to be the only bit of good news I'd heard anywhere in my research. It said well, at least my trip would be a weight loss clinic uh, for me. Uh, well, after TR's trip, 
there were two expeditions first that tried to go down to retrace this. One was a Brazilian expedition that went down, started down the river and was never seen again, probably killed by Indians. Another was an American expedition. They went down and got chased back by the Indians. And then, oh, about 20 years later, there was one single expedition with three people sent by the Theodore Roosevelt Association uh, to prove that TR did it. The British were questioning that, seemed absurd since TR said, I was at the top and I was at the bottom and there's no other way around. But anyway, that was successful. And from then until 1992, as far as I knew, there had been no one else there. And the area was, uh, uh, had been designated as a Indian reserve for the Central Lager Indians, a huge, huge area, and nobody was allowed to go in that area. And we, of course, had to get uh, special uh, uh, dispensation to do all this. So now I'm going to tell you a little about my trip. Uh, time had passed. It was really clear. It was clear it was going to happen. I was getting more and more concerned. I had two little children then, and uh, they were very small. And my wife was on me about, yeah, you can't go there. What are you going to do, leave them with no dad? And this, and I thought maybe I'd have a way out. Well, unfortunately, uh, I was with my mother one day, and my mother asked me, she said, Tweed, do you know why TR went down that river? Well, I knew what he'd said, but I said, well, no, what? tell me, mother. She said, his statement was, it was my last chance to be a boy. I said, yes, I, yes, mother. And she said, now, Tweed, do you know why you're going down this river? And I was a little nervous about this. And I said, well, all right, mother, what? And she said, well, it's your first chance to be a man. Ooh. Well, that was quite a challenge. And I figured I was stuck now. I had to go down. Uh, now we're getting really close to the expedition. And a friend of mine threw a goodbye party. And uh, oh, I noticed there were a whole bunch of docs there. And I was rather flattered and, uh, until I realized these doctors were there looking at the patient before he got sick. Uh, that was one thing that I realized. The other thing I realized, I'd heard about the Kandaroo. The Kandaroo is a sort of legendary. It's a tiny, tiny little catfish. It's called the toothpick fish. It's almost microscopic, not quite, but almost. And what it does is it, it's a parasitic fish. It swims into the gills of other fish, lodges itself into the gills to suck blood. And it has very sharp backward uh, pointing spines on its fins. And its tail is like a reverse umbrella, a backwards facing umbrella with very sharp spines. So it's really hard to pull it out. And uh, this fish was uh, rumored to follow urine train. Tra trails, urine trails, which made, uh, you know, people like me a little nervous. I thought this was just a, maybe a myth. So at, I asked one of the docs at this party who happened to be a friend of mine who's a urologist and said, what about this? I, it's a myth, isn't it? And he said, oh, no, no. He said, I just read a journal article last week and I'll send it to you. I said, oh, God. So the journal article arrives. And it's a typical medical journal article. And it was very clear by the time I got through reading it, that this was a real thing and this really happened. And the article, like all those journal articles, wound up with uh, uh, a uh, uh, piece on telling doctors what they should do about patients who are unfortunate enough to suffer from this. And the operative word, so to speak, was amputation. So that was pretty discouraging. Uh, and uh, so from there, uh, let me, let me, uh, uh, go into the slideshow section. This will take a second for me to figure out how to do it. Uh, I do that and I do that and that should share my screen and this should be it. Okay, I hope you all can see this. Uh, and so I'm gonna show you a bunch of slides here uh, that as we go on. So uh, let me start out uh, by telling you a little bit about the Amazon. Here's Brazil. And the Amazon Valley, this is the highlands I mentioned all around the edge of it. The Amazon uh, is roughly the size of the lower 48 states. And of course, its primary piece is the major Amazon. Now let me tell you, river, let me tell you a little about it. It starts here in the Andes Mountains, very high, and goes all the way here down to the sea. Now, rivers can be measured uh, by length. 
And the Amazon and the Nile are about the same length, depending how you measure them, one or another can be longer. And that's about 4,000 miles long. So that's one issue. The second thing you can talk about rivers is drop, how much it drops per mile. And the Amazon uh, in the Highlands area here, it's quite two, very, two different rivers. Up here, the drop is 35 feet per mile. And then when it gets here to Iquitos, now this is about 2,000 miles. When it gets to Iquitos, uh, the drop, it's a very flat river. This whole central area was a, a lake or ocean bed. And so the drop is only uh, about half an inch a mile. But there's so much water in it that uh, it, uh, it keeps the acceleration going. Now the, the uh, Amazon is nine times the size of the Mississippi in volume. So volume is another measure. It's the most volume of any river. Uh, and the water in it, the amount of water in there, if you take all the fresh water in the world, uh, all the way, you know, all the lakes and all the fresh water in the world, uh, one fifth of it is in the Amazon. And by the way, about you know, all the rainforest, about a third of the water is recycled. Uh, now, in this long flat area here, uh, the water moves through often at four and five knots, even though it's very, uh, you know, very flat. And there is a point here, which is the deepest uh, river Rhine point in the world. It's about a thousand miles upriver, and it's over 300 feet deep. And for much of this region, the width of the Amazon, it's as wide as the English Channel. So you can see this is a, uh, uh, a tremendous river with all kinds of uh, uh, volume of water in it and moving along fast. So uh, in itself, the river is very interesting and there is tremendous diversity in the Amazon. Uh, you all know about it. I'll just give you a couple of examples. When we, we, we flew to Manaus, which was here, and I'll talk a little about that in a minute, but we flew to Manaus and Manaus, uh, is, is a very interesting city in its own right. Uh, but we stayed at a little hotel and behind the hotel, uh, there was a little sort of pond that was maybe one acre in size. And uh, an ichthyologist friend of mine told me that uh, in that one pond, there were more fish than there were in all of European rivers from Portugal to the, uh, to the uh, Urals. And another example is I had a friend who was a uh, uh, entomologist and he uh, uh, told me that at one point in his life he was collecting, he was doing species counts and he was collecting uh, species of insects from trees. And what he would do is he'd put sheets around the bottom and then he would uh, uh, smoke the trees and all the insects would be stunned and come down and he would uh, count them. And in one tree, just one tree, he found 10,000 species. I don't think I have to say much more about, uh, about uh, diversity. Anyway, uh, let's see now, let's just start slides. So we headed to Manaus and there's Manaus. That's kind of Manaus. That's kind of a misleading uh, picture because uh, Manaus at the time we were there was a city of a million people. Uh, but it didn't have any high rises or anything like that. And also it was a city that uh, was unconnected by road to the rest of the world. The only way you could get to Manaus then was either fly or by river. And everybody did everything they could uh, by river. So it was kind of an interesting town from that point of view. Now it was founded in the 1870s, 1880s as a uh, rubber town. There was a huge rubber boom uh, rubber was important because of uh, uh, bicycle tires was used then and uh, uh, you only could get rubber from rubber trees uh, in the in the Amazon forest so it was a difficult process in the trees you, these weren't plantations they were widely spread but because they controlled uh, rubber it became a boom town they had a complete corner on it it could charge anything they wanted and the result was that they became fabulously wealthy. So it was an odd combination back in the 1880s between uh, 
a frontier town and a very rich town. And so there are all kinds of stories. One story is that one of the mayors decided to build a huge palace residence for his wife. And just as he completed it, he got thrown out uh, as mayor and a new mayor take, took over. And the new mayor wasn't gonna have his wife uh, uh, live in somebody else's house. So he got a bunch of dynamite, blew up the house and rebuilt it, another one. So it was that kind of place, kind of place. There were a lot of Portuguese there and the kind of place Portuguese women would send their laundry back to Portugal uh, to be done. So uh, one other thing they decided is that they, want, they felt like second class citizens and they wanted to have uh, be recognized as a first class place. They said, what do you need if you're going to be a first class place? Well, what you need is an opera house. And so they built themselves one. And there it is. It's absolutely spectacular. Uh, well, they built this opera house, but of course they didn't have anybody who could sing opera. And so they went around, nobody particularly, anybody who was any good at opera wanted to go a thousand miles up river to this fever driven area. And, uh, but they managed to finally find somebody to come a French or Italian, probably fifth rate opera company to sing here. And they came. Uh, now, this opera house seats 2,000 people, and at the time, the town only had 20,000 people. But anyway, they gave maybe seven or eight performances, uh, and then they got sick, and they got yellow fever, and half the company died of yellow fever. So there haven't been any operas there since. Uh, they hadn't forgotten TR. This was the mayor's boat, and if you look carefully on the, the name, it's called the President Roosevelt. Uh, here I am, that's the captain. Now this looks like a friendly greeting, but actually I'm desperately trying to drag him down because he's trying to drag me up with that little very slippery wooden gang bike and I would have none of it. Uh, let me introduce you to some of the people on our, in our group. Uh, that's the guy that was the organizer. He's the guy that put all this together. Uh, we decided we should take uh, Two, now I remember I told you this was a closed area with Central Lager, and the Central Lager were vehement about keeping people out. And it was rumored that when some of the Brazilian sort of sketchy types went in there to illegally log or gold mine, that if they refused to leave, they would, would get killed by the Indians. So we wanted to have somebody come with us and, uh, and sort of vouch for us and say we were just passing through and we weren't doing gold or anything. So we took two Indians with us. Wonderful. Uh, this is Otomita, uh, and he was just a terrific guy. I learned more from him about the jungle than anything else, and also some about TR. We also took three Brazilian scientists. We took a uh, botanist, an ichthyologist, a fish guy, and an ethnobotanist to look at what people, how people use the forest. They didn't get to do much, but they did, in fact, later come back. Um, he, he's a New Yorker. Uh, this is Mark Greenberg. He came, he was our photojournalist. Well, let me tell you, it's great to take a photojournalist. Oh, by the way, that butterfly, we called her Glenda. She sort of fell in love with him and stuck with him for two days. Anyway, you want to take a photojournalist with you. So uh, uh, he was it. And the reason you want to take a photojournalist, first of all, of course, they can take excellent pictures, but much more importantly, you yourself will be the subject of the pictures, and that's very valuable. Uh, we took a doctor. Uh, that's John Walden. Uh, he was tremendously skilled. Unfortunately, he passed away last year. Uh, he's, his background was he was a professor at the University of Marshall Medical School, Marshall University Medical School. Uh, he was an experienced emergency physician. He knew about infectious disease and tropical medicine. Uh, but what was most important, he'd spent most of his free time, all his life, down in the Amazon, trekking alone with Indians in very remote areas and going into in Indian villages and introducing medicine and so on. And uh, he, uh, uh, he, was, he really knew what, what he was doing, and we were delighted to have him. He, he, this would be his 60th or so trip uh, to the Amazon. We also, we were going to use Avon boats, Whitewater River rafts, and uh, they came from a company called Sobec uh, that supplied them, and they supplied, uh, we, there would be five of them, five boat people. This is Kelly. Kelly was a little slip of a thing. 
Uh, and, and that was a big challenge. You can see how, we'll see how difficult voting was. That's not a problem with the f color and the photography. She has just painted herself with uh, uh, fluid from those seeds, uh, which makes her kind of very red. And the Indians used it as war paint. We'd heard that it was a, uh, could be an insect propellant too, uh, but, uh, and, and we wore it, but that's not why we wore it. We wore it just because it made us feel like explorers. Uh, well, here we're going. We have now gone down uh, to, the, uh, to the nearest point where town was to where the river started. And we went, it's a very small little town. And this paved road looks fine, but it didn't last very long, uh, uh, maybe three or four miles. And then it became this, and then this sort of thing happened. In the Amazon, there's good news and bad news. The bad news here clearly is that huge tree. It was ironwood. If you hit it with a double-bitted ax, full strength, you'd barely make a nick in it, probably knock your teeth out. So there's no way to cut it up. But the good news here was the mud. We could dig it out and get the trucks under it. The problem is that in the Amazon, good news becomes bad news and mud is all over the place. And then we quickly determined, went into this. It was really hard work trying to get these trucks through and then there was no road or anything. We had to build it through the forest, um, which made build it or you know, squeeze our way through, made it pretty difficult. We also had very light tires and they were constantly being punctured and we were changing tires all the time. Well, it took quite a while, but eventually we got to the river. And there's a picture as how it is, an image of how it is today, a beautiful spot cool to the river. Remember all around us, it's 99 degrees temperature and 99 degrees uh, humidity. So this river really looked beautiful. Here it is in TR's time. Now I have a bunch of images of TR's uh, time and you can tell them because they're in black and white. It's interesting here, they built a little bridge you can see on the left and it's interesting to me that uh, uh, the forest looked more degraded then than it does now. Uh, now, the jungle's a dangerous place, and here's an example. This is a kind of a bamboo-y kind of tree, and those are, you can't see, get an idea of size, but those are three inches long spikes with absolute needle sharp at the end of them. And uh, so you learn very quickly in the Amazon, you don't lean against anything or you're in real trouble. Or if you drop something on the ground, you don't look on the ground and back around and back into one of these things. And remember, we were in rubber rafts. Uh, now, if you look closely, that's a tree trunk and there's a whole bunch of caterpillars. And what you can't tell there is those caterpillars are about five to six inches long. And I figured, well, you know, they're caterpillars. They probably, you know, grew up to be something like this. This is a butterfly tiger swallowtail. We, it looks almost exactly like the tiger swallowtail here. Uh, and maybe they did grow up to do that, but before that, this happened. Well, when we got to the river, the first thing we all did is jump into it. It was nice and cool and we swam around. And uh, this is Cabral. Cabral was one of the three Brazilian scientists and the one that had the most respect as being the toughest guy in my office. He was really tough. Well, he jumped into the water too and he jumped out. As soon as he got out, he fell to his knees like this. That's the doctor on the right, clearly in great pain. And within a few minutes, he was lying on his back moaning and morale was plunging. Uh, so I said to the doctor, you got to do something. He said, I gave him three Demerol shots, but not much I can do. Uh, and that, po that point, Otomita came by, the Indian, and he said, oh, he touched one of those uh, uh, caterpillars. Uh, it won't kill him, but it'll take a week or two for him to recover. And then, uh, which was, turned out to be true. And then Otomita said, oh, by the way, where you were in the water, there are a whole bunch of stingrays in there, and that pain from them is much, much worse. Well, we all began to think about why we were really here. So here's TR ready to go down the river in his pith helmet and all. And there I am ready to go down the river. Uh, keep in mind that Cabral is in that raft behind me moaning. Uh, 
So I took this picture, you know, as mm -hmm. sort of weak race. So down the river we go. There it is. The first one. You can see we're in whitewater rafts uh, at exactly the same spot that TR went into the river. He's in dugouts. And one of the differences you can see, if you look there, you see the freeboard on that dugout isn't very much. And so immediately they had problems. They came into these rapids and they were uh, very, with lots of them and very difficult. Here's our first rapid you can see from today, what it looks like in the same shot, same area from TR's times. Uh, but we were in Avon rafts and we could go down most of these rapids. He had to portage around them. So there's a whitewater raft and there it is. Now I'm of the opinion that if you have to do something unpleasant like a root canal, you don't practice beforehand. Uh, so I've never been in white water before. And so I figured this was just wait until we get there. So this was my first time. Uh, you can see the boatman and heavily loaded. Imagine Kelly doing that, that little slip of a thing. Amazing. It's hard, hard work going down. Uh, and here we are. Uh, you can't see me, but I'm right there. So uh, the rapids were really quite a challenge. And the boat people, their job was to get us down alive. So they did it as well they could. Uh, and we had a kayak, as you can see there, that helped a lot. Okay, TR went towards the heavy and what he wore and his camping goods. We were much lighter and better, so that helped somewhat. Let's talk about food quickly. This was early in the expedition, uh, but mostly what we ate was space food. It was uh, uh, you, you freeze-dried, you boil it, made what we called glop, there was pork glop and chicken glop and uh, beef glop and shrimp glop and so on. And we had rice and noodles. Uh, and uh, one of the problems was the rice, uh, we'd bought it locally and the locals had uh, weighed it down with little pebbles and sand. And also we'd spilled some gasoline on it. So that was a problem. Anyway, down the river, here we go. Uh, now, I don't particularly like that picture, but this is meant to show you that there are even rapids we couldn't get around. So we, you know, there were falls and rapids. So we had to portage. And we carried the Avon rafts. They weighed about 150 pounds, so we could do it. TR was a totally different situation. His canoes weighed uh, 2,500 uh, 2, to 3,000 pounds and really hard to get around. And of course, the way you went around rapids, it was steep area. And what they did, they had to cut roads. And you can see those roller logs there. They rolled them down. It would take them several days to go around a rapid. And they had to go around many. We went, I think, we had a portage maybe six times. They were between 30 and 40 times. And the problem is you'd spend like three days, really hard work, four days, hard work. Finally, you'd get back on the river, they would. And... 15 minutes later, they'd come to the next rapid. We, my respect for them grew and grew. We were able to get over most of those. But portaging wasn't easy. That's Kelly with two big oars and probably an 80 pound pack. She was really quite something. And it exhausted us. There I am, you can see in one of the boat people, we looked like we were kind of completely exhausted. But when you got back on the river, things were fine and it looked nice uh, and it was cool there and it was great. Now we came across some interesting sites. Uh, this is a, a little gap and it's a sole gap. This entire river here, this was just before the entire river went through that gap. And uh, it, I don't know how deep it was there, but it must have been really deep. Uh, and TR, of course, uh, sorry, TR confronted this too. And there's George Cherry showing with a gun. I had a butterfly net. Don't know what that means. But what, one interesting, somebody later on told me, you see this little, uh, sort of pile of foam there. 80 years later, it's still there. I was really amazed at that. So here's another structure, so to be, that's not a, that's not a uh, stump, it's a rock. And it wasn't near the river, there on top of it is TR and Rondon. And after considerable difficulty in search, uh, John Walden, the doctor, found the same rock. There I am with him on top of it. It was fascinating. I, you know, my feeling was, first of all, probably no one else had stood on that rock uh, since TR's time. And uh, I'm not a mystical type, but I've retraced several of TR's trips and that he felt good about it. This was really tough. He didn't feel so good. And I felt a little of that. Uh, let's talk about insects. Those are Africanized bees. 
they sting, it's a problem, but not serious. I got stung once 14 times before breakfast, but okay. This is what explorers, everybody complains about most. They're little tiny sweat bees, and I, but they're stingless. They don't sting you. And I wonder, you know, every, you read every explorer, this is what they have their venom for. And I just I said, well, what's the problem? They don't sting. Well, the problem is they come in their millions and they crawl all over you and they're all around you and you can't get rid of them. You can't get away from them. And they crawl up your nose and in your ears and your eyes and your mouth. Just drives you crazy. And, uh, you know, as soon as you get back on the river, they're gone. But so we only were there one day suffering from this TR for four or five days had to do this. And this, people literally went mad over this uh, sometimes. And uh, so that was a problem. Here's another problem. That's my back. Uh, there are some noceums called peons there and they bite you. And one of the problems is that that bite uh, lasts for a uh, week or more. And uh, what we had for, to deal with this was DEET and Skin So Soft. And Skin So Soft worked on these things. You put it on you, it was kind of greasy. They'd land on you. The greasy stuff would wick up their legs and suffocate the bastards. We loved it. You'd have piles of them. But, you know, I didn't go around with my back thing. This, I'd just come out of swing. I'd get that in 15 minutes. Anyway, insects were a bit of a problem. Uh, TR had it too. They had insect, what they called fly dope, I think they called it. it uh, but it didn't work nearly as well as D. But you could do this and it was good. Now, I was collecting, and since I'm a bit of an amateur entomologist, I was collecting insects for the American Museum of Natural History. Beautiful insects there. That's a little boll weevil. The reason I got the plastic, if you could see it in the Amazon, don't touch it. It's maybe uh, uh, poisonous. Now, if you look carefully here, you can see that this is a, a grasshopper emerging from an exoskeleton. You could see it anywhere in the Northeast or in the United States at any time. The difference is size. And there are lots of very big insects there. Uh, and there's a spider. I, I took those gloves. It's a true value. I was hoping they'd hire me on as a spokesperson. I'd make lots of money, but they didn't. Uh, so I was collecting insects at night. I uh, couldn't during the day because we were going down the river. So at night I would collect them. And what I did is I had a generator and a light and a little tiny bit of gasoline. And my plan was to bring as much, many insects to the center of camp as I could every night. And I knew that wouldn't be particularly popular. So I wondered what to do about it. And then it occurred to me, you know, I have to preserve them in, uh, in some kind of liquid. And so what I brought was, there had a number of choices. What I brought was 100% laboratory grade grain alcohol. In other words, 200 proof vodka. I'd fill the bottles, and of course I couldn't put insects in them if the bottles were full, so I had to pour a little out, and if people around, you know, had a cup, I'd pour it into the cup. All we had to mix with it was tang, but I became extremely popular, uh, and nobody complained about the insects, so that was kind of fun. Uh, here I'm showing Odomid. He knew everything about all the animals, but here I was showing him some insects, and he was having trouble with these until I wondered why, and then I realized uh, that's a book of insects of North America, so he's a little troubled identifying it. And I kept notes. There's a huge longhorn beetle. A bunch of other stuff I thought might hire me as a spokesperson did work. So here I'm taking my notes, but this is really a staged uh, uh, photo because that's TR. Now TR on the expedition is as sick as he was and as difficult as it was. Uh, he wrote uh, his book, Through the Brazilian Wilderness, the whole book on the expedition. So he was finished when he staggered out in the bottom. To me, that was really impressive. There I am afterwards, uh, 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 they're making fun of me, sleeping during the day. We went during the rainy season and it rained and sometimes it really rained. He wanted to go in the rainy season so the water was high enough so he could get around uh, many of the rapids or go over many of the rapids. Uh, but we were lucky about the rain. There were beautiful scenes along the way. Uh, there's TR uh, with Indians. He didn't see it in the trip. This was before the trip. In our trip, we did come across one Indian village. These were very remote. It was many days trek to get there. They, but you did see trade goods. They'd probably never seen a white before. But you can see the clothing they're wearing uh, were trade goods. When, when we arrived, well, his, I love this scene. This was a thing, but look at, look at his uh, shirt. It says America, USA. But when we arrived at this village, there was nobody in the huts. There were maybe 20 huts there. 
And I'd heard stories about how Indians disappear as soon as they uh, see outsiders coming. So we went around where we found all the Indians. They were all in one of the more remote huts. They were all uh, gathered around. And what they had in the hut is they had a generator, they had a, 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 a satellite dish, and they had a little television, and they were watching Star Trek, if you will believe it. Captain Kirk speaking in Portuguese. I had no idea what they made. They didn't speak Portuguese. I had no idea what they made. They had to bring me all this equipment in, you know, several days walking. Uh, now let me talk a little about snakes. That's Tatare, our other uh, Indian who went with us. I had heard there were snakes all over the place, but I never saw them until the Indians started pointing out they were all over the place. That's a rattlesnake that was right over our heads that we didn't know until the Indian couldn't have been five feet away. The Indians told us about it. And that's, uh, that's a snake called the uh, Fer de Lance. It's the most poisonous snake in all of South America. We were in rubber boats, you know, and they were self bailing, so we were barefoot. And at the end of a day, we found that this snake was in us, in the boat, all day long. Um, and uh, uh, we were really lucky we weren't bitten. You can see there uh, the lead boat person looking at me as if I am crazy. Uh, I asked uh, John, the doctor, what about, you know, anti-venom? Do we have some? And he said, no, we can't bring it. It needs to be specific for the snake and refrigerated, so we have nothing. If you were bitten, you were probably dead. We decided to take some communications stuff with us, this was the first, we took four, we had four kinds of candidates. This was one, a satellite phone. That's what a satellite phone looked like in those days. But it was 500 pounds, we couldn't take it. The other two, we couldn't either. So we wound up with this thing called an EPIRP. And uh, what it did was when it got wet, no vocal, no voice, it sent a signal to Canada, which would activate saying help and would activate a worldwide uh, effort to come find us. And uh, uh, so he's demonstrating to us Accidentally, he set it off, and nine days later, this arrived. No pontoons. This is what it's like all around us. Uh, this little airplane came. It dropped a Coke bottle. We opened up the Coke bottle, and inside it said, uh, uh, are you all right? And uh, we didn't know what to make of that. We waved at him, and he flew away, and that was the end of the worldwide effort to save us. So snake bite was an issue. Uh, we did get some things. That's a minor sort of nasty looking thing. Uh, those, however, recovered on our own, except one of us had it when he got back to the States and the CDC was never able to figure out what it was. Well, here we are. And now we're in the flat part. And this is a little homestead. There were six of them on TR's day through several, a couple hundred miles. TR's day, there were, I think, 30 or 40 of them. Uh, and these people were living a very sort of sketchy life there. Uh, those are grapefruits. Apparently this crowd didn't like grapefruits, so they gave them all to us. And the reason we were so happy with the grapefruits is remember the tang, this was much better. Well, this, they survived any way they could. And they did okay, actually. But there was, of course, an illegal trail and uh, 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 trade in, in uh, protected species skins. There's a little girl uh, with her three-toed sloth. She's so cute. Uh, so the river now is getting very big. You see how wide it is. We're getting close. Uh, but like, you know, who goes on an expedition without putting up a sign? So we put up a sign like this, and so did TR. Uh, and uh, so we were getting close to the end, and we knew, I knew we were going to be very close to the end, because we had maps, TR had no idea. And so this was a boat that was sent up to pick us up, this first little tiny settlement. And I uh, uh, thought for a couple of days before we got there, what would be the first thing I would do when I got to civilization? Would it be a big steak? Would it be a beer? Well, there's the first thing, an outhouse. Um, so our trip came to the end, just like TR, and somebody at some point asked TR, well, what did he think about his trip? And his answer, which is, I hope, the same answer you give about uh, my talk, he said, it was bully while it lasted, but it lasted long enough. So that's uh, uh, my uh, uh, talk, and now we're ready for the Q&A. The first question we have, I understand that... <laughs> 
Theodore Roosevelt drew a map of the river that he wanted to keep secret until his book was published. Can you tell us uh, the story about that? Well, that's a very interesting story. Uh, that is true. He had done a map and he wanted to keep it secret, as I said. And uh, so T.R., right after this expedition, went over to England and uh, where he wanted to, he gave a talk at the Royal Geographical Society. And he hadn't published his book yet. It was going to be published in England and the United States. He was coming back on, uh, on a liner and it happened that Houdini was on the liner. Uh, and so that was interesting. The captain, of course, uh, wanted Houdini to perform for the first class passengers, so he, Houdini did. And as part of his performance, he did some mind reading tricks, uh, exercises, uh, things. And so he, uh, he asked TR, he said, I'm gonna read your mind, uh, Colonel. TR, like he's called Colonel. I'm gonna read your mind. And he asked TR uh, to think of something. And uh, so TR thought of something. And uh, he's, you know, he went through his whole spiel and everything. And then uh, he had kind of a, you know, maybe a tripod there, which he had something covered up. And he said, I know what you're thinking. I know what you're thinking. Here it is. And he whipped the cover away from it. And there was the map that TR had kept so secret. Uh, and this caused you know, practically a riot. And sure enough, TR was, was uh, uh, astounded by it. Uh, Houdini eventually told the secret of this. It was quite interesting. Uh, he knew he was going to be on the ship. He knew TR was going to be on the ship. So he prepared beforehand. And what he did is he went to the British publisher that was going to publish TR's book, bribed one of the, uh, the you know, workmen there, the letter print guy or somebody, and got a copy of the map. Uh, and then when he was on the ship and when he was, he knew he'd be asked to do this. And then he knew how to ask TR in such a way as to get TR to think about the map. And that's how he did it. An extraordinary story. I don't think TR ever knew, knew that, knew how he did it. was just astounded. So that's that. Well, thank you. Uh, the next question is um, from a viewer who asks, why did TR choose Kermit and not Teddy Jr. or Archie or Quentin? That's a very interesting question. It, it had nothing to do, they, they, I explained why it was in this particular case, but the more important question is why did he Kermit, take Kermit to Africa? And it's very interesting. One of the s problems with our family is alcoholism, as most families. TR's brother was an alcoholic and died of alcoholism. And TR early on came to the conclusion that his son might have a problem. Uh, and so he focused efforts and he did these various things to try to encourage uh, T.R. Uh, Kermit to, uh, uh, you know, to fight this terrible disease. Uh, and, uh, and so he took him to Africa and that's also why he took him to Brazil. Uh, unfortunately, ultimately, this was uh, to no avail because uh, uh, Kermit eventually became an alcoholic and actually died of it during the Second World War. So TR didn't, but they didn't know how to deal with alcoholism then. Uh, they viewed it as a moral issue. And so TR's efforts were, you know, kind-hearted, but not very effective. Uh, and so it's unfortunate of all the alcoholics in those days. So that's why. The um, next question is from a radiologist and he asks, um, as a radiologist, I see foot disasters all the time. I can't imagine that TR went through what he went through with pen knife surgery. Uh, did you at least did he did he at least have quinine water to help with all the flying insects? Well, they knew about quinine, and they took quinine. He's quite, you're quite right, sir. They did take quinine, uh, and that helped uh, a little bit. You know, several points into about disease. First of all, the kinds of diseases that you get on rivers like this, they're the insect-borne and the waterborne. Now, waterborne you get because people upriver are dumping things into the river that carry the disease, and there was nobody upriver here. So you didn't have to worry about uh, uh, waterborne. Insect-borne also, they're vectors. They have to have, uh, you know, transmit between people. So I think in, in the case of this expedition, it's the fact that some of them, TR, 
specifically, had malaria before they went on the trip, so the mosquitoes could transmit it. Quinine would help. Uh, and uh, I, I don't have, you know, we don't know what happened to the paddlers. It wouldn't surprise me in the least if some of them had suffered from malaria and malaria killed them. Malaria is a huge killer even today. So the insects problem, it was a problem, but not as much as you might think if you face these insects uh, in an urban area, yellow fever and so on. And we have time for one more question. Um, how long was your passage down the Amazon versus uh, Theodore Roosevelt's passage? Okay, that's an easy one. We were on the river for 30 days. Uh, he was on the river for more than 60. Uh, and, and the main differences were there was, I've already described, uh, it was tough for us, but boy, nothing like what it was for them. So anyway, uh, I very much appreciate you all coming to this uh, talk. Uh, our next talk is next month, middle of the month. Uh, the subject is TR Master Diplomat. And I think this is a really interesting talk because TR is not thought of as a nuanced diplomat, but in fact, it was a very dangerous time and he did very interesting things, primarily keeping us out of war. And so I hope you'll come back and join us for that uh, in the middle of October. Uh, and by the way, if, if you want to see any of the past talks or recommend this one to others, just go to uh, roosevelt.liu.edu and this will be up sometime next week uh, for anybody that wants to see it. So I want to thank you all for joining us uh, and I really look forward to seeing you next month.